Hey there, Kieran Ryan here and you're very welcome to Cardio Health Tip number 2, Resolving Cholesterol. Today you'll learn what is cholesterol and what it does, you'll learn the truth about cholesterol and what it actually means to your health, how we came to believe what we believe about cholesterol, what the real cause of heart disease is, and what changes you can make to your diet to truly protect yourself from heart disease. So what does cholesterol do exactly? Well it's produced in the liver as needed, but it can also be obtained from animal foods. It's needed for the activation of vitamin D3. Without it, we wouldn't activate vitamin D3, which is important for uh, strong bones. And it's also important for switching on and off certain genes, such as cancer genes. It's needed for the formation of steroid hormones, and they're your stress and your sex hormones. They'd be things like cortisol, testosterone, estrogen. Without it, you wouldn't have your get up and go in the morning. Uh, you would have low libido, low drive, and probably sexual dysfunction as well. It's a component of healthy cell membranes. So every cell, its outer layer, its membrane is made partly by cholesterol. So you need cholesterol for that. And without it, your cell wouldn't be able to communicate between the inside of the cell where the DNA is and the outside of the cell where the rest of the body is. So very important. It's important for brain and memory. If you've got low cholesterol levels, you can suffer a memory loss and even amnesia. And it's essential for the formation of bile acids. Now bile acids are used to break down fats and without it you wouldn't be able to digest and absorb fats properly in your body. So cholesterol is actually very important for all of these different things. Now why if cholesterol is important for all those different things do a lot of people have the conception that cholesterol is really bad, I must get rid of cholesterol, get it out of my food, get it out of my body and keep it as far away from me as possible. Well it all began back in 1856 when Rudolf Virchow proposed the lipid hypothesis. Now Virchow was a surgeon and he was a doctor and a scientist and while he was cutting up dead bodies and cadavers to find out the cause of heart disease he found that there was hardened plaque inside there arteries and this was mostly composed of cholesterol so he put forward the hypothesis that it was fat in the diet that was blocking up the arteries and that if you lowered the fat in your diet you could in fact prevent this disease from occurring. In 1913 Nikolai Anchikov fed rabbits a high cholesterol diet. Now he took rabbits and he put them on a special feed of animal products which is kind of strange for, anim for rabbits and found that the legions formed inside their arteries. So he surmised that if high cholesterol diets were actually causing heart disease in the rabbits so therefore they'd probably be causing them in humans too. Now later they did studies with dogs and they found that the dogs didn't actually get uh, any cardiovascular disease from eating high cholesterol diets um, because the dogs were able to turn the cholesterol into bile acids and excrete them and humans can actually do that too. In 1948, Framingham Health Study in Massachusetts uncovered uh, cardiovascular disease risk factors. Now they uncovered hundreds of different risk factors. Uh, high cholesterol, high serum cholesterol was one of the factors. But they also uncovered things like loneliness, depression, isolation, divorce. All these things had huge effects on cardiovascular disease, interestingly enough. They found other things, obesity, smoking, sedentary lifestyle. These were also risk factors too. So they literally found hundreds of factors. And it would be kind of strange, but at the time they wanted to prove that the lipid hypothesis was true. And they really searched hard to find a connection between dietary fat intake and cardiovascular disease and they found none. In fact the study was so inconclusive it was never actually published in a journal. In 1956 Ansel Keys did his seven country study. He found that countries that did, ate the most saturated fat had the highest incidences of cardiovascular disease and countries that ate the lowest level of saturated fat had the lowest levels of cardiovascular disease. So with simple comparisons like Finland to Japan, Finland having a high level and of saturated fat intake and Japan having a low level of saturated fat intake, he'd found that yes, there was indeed a correlation between saturated fat intake and cardiovascular disease. However, it later turned out that he'd actually studied 22 countries, but he'd only cherry picked 
the very best of those countries for his publication. So this caused a lot of doubt and a lot of people discredited uh, Ansel Keys for his work because they found that the correlation was actually very weak when you included the full 22 countries. Ansel Keys himself was a big protagonist of the uh, low fat diet and interestingly he did actually live to be about 100 himself so maybe there was actually something in what he was saying. In 1976 Akira Endo created the first statin, mevastatin, and the idea was that if you could lower the cholesterol that's actually produced in your liver, you would prevent cardiovascular disease. This idea was jumped upon by the pharmaceutical industry because now they could actually produce a drug and patent a drug that they could sell that could actually uh, fight cardiovascular disease. Before that, they just didn't have any drugs. So literally now they had something that they could put a price tag on and sell to people. So they started making lots of different statins, different companies making different statins, and many of them made sense. Some of the more modern ones are Lipitor, Crestor, Lescol, Zocor, and Lipostat. And you might be familiar with some of those. Now, so from the lipid hypothesis, uh, which became very, at first it was very refuted back in the night, all the way in the 1950s, it was actually the more alternative doctors and, and nutritionists who advocated the low fat diet. But later on, it gradually became more and more accepted. Uh, when the pharmaceutical companies got interested in it, they started publishing all their own research and they started look, looking at niggly little bits of, of research such as, you know, um, saturated fat intake would actually increase receptors in the liver. They started looking at very, in a very reductionist sort of manner, pulling out pieces of evidence showing that, yes, this theory was in fact correct and it really backed up their use of statin drugs. So the message we keep getting was to lower cholesterol and the food companies jumped on this too because a whole new market opened up for low fat spreads and low fat foods and they could start creating processed foods which were far cheaper to actually create and sell and had longer shelf life and at the same time they could be selling them as healthy foods because they were now low fat and this has created a billion dollar uh, industry for, for both of those two different industries. However, there has been a lot of confounding evidence about, around the lipid hypothesis. For a start, certain tribes have high fat diets yet low levels of cardiovascular disease and one of those would be the Inuit people in the very north of America and they would, their diet would consist of fish, it would consist of uh, whale blubber, very very high in fats and yet the incidences of cardiovascular disease would be very very low. And they wouldn't, and even though they might display high cholesterol levels, they still wouldn't actually be getting cardiovascular disease either. Certain foods such as eggs are high in cholesterol, but no link to heart disease has ever been established. Uh, there's other foods as well, like meats and dairy products, but the, all these foods, even though the cholesterol level is very high, there's never actually been any clear link with cardiovascular disease. Half of people who suffer heart attacks have low or normal levels of cholesterol. Now that is very interesting. Um, this is people who've been administered to hospital, they've had their cholesterol levels checked and they found that they've had low and normal levels of cholesterol even though, even though they have, or they, they've suffered a heart attack. Numerous studies show no association between saturated fat intake and heart disease. So there's actually been a lot of studies, a lot of cohort studies and a lot of meta-analysis which actually show there is no link between saturated fat intake and heart disease. So this, all this evidence is very confounding to the lipid hypothesis. So Cholesterol research has shown us that the story is not as simple as saturated fat equals risk of heart attack. They found that for a start there is not just one type of cholesterol but there's actually two types of cholesterol. Now there's the LDL cholesterol. The LDL cholesterol is your 
is being nicknamed the bad cholesterol and the reason being is that LDL cholesterol, LDL stands for low density lipoprotein and it's a carrying molecule that carries cholesterol around the body. It's produced in the liver and it carries cholesterol to where it's needed in the body. So it could just be to create a cell membrane, but it could also be to the site of the arteries uh, where the cardiovascular disease is. And so they noticed the relationship between LDL and a cardiovascular disease and they nicknamed it the bad cholesterol. Then there's the HDL cholesterol. Now the HDL high density lipoprotein is the carrier molecule which carries the cholesterol from the body back to the liver where it's, where it's excreted as bile acids which in turn helps you to break down fat. So the HDL had been nicknamed the good cholesterol because literally it was taking cholesterol back out of the body. So therefore reducing your cholesterol. So according to the lipid hypothesis, this should be good. So they also found out that there are tri triglycerides in the blood and that's free fatty acids that just float around inside your blood. And they're carried by a molecule called the VLDL or very low density lipoprotein. And this has also been associated with cardiovascular disease. Although most of the emphasis has been on the LDL and HDL ratio, high triglycerides is also a risk factor. So, different people ha interestingly have different approaches to what is a good idea uh, between um, what's a good way of measuring these. Your doctor who prescribes statins and has statins in his toolbox and the only way your doctor can actually deal with cardiovascular disease because they're not trained nutritionists um, they're, they, they use medical drugs so the only way they actually know how to do it is to through using statins and, and drugs like that and statins lower LDL cholesterol so for your doctor LDL cholesterol or for a conventional doctor at least LDL cholesterol is very important now for an insurance company who doesn't actually prescribe any drugs but they are very interested in how long someone's going to live because clearly if somebody dies early they, they lose money but if someone dies later they actually make a lot more money and so they can set the they want to set their premiums and charge how much money based on how long and estimate how long they think someone's going to live interestingly for them it's hdl cholesterol which is really important um they don't even look at ldl cholesterol they actually just look at what your HDL cholesterol is in comparison to your total cholesterol. And if you have a ratio of three to one, according to them, you're absolutely fine. So, and they will give you a good insurance deal. So very interesting, two different institutions looking at it in two different ways. Research has also found that there's a difference in the size of the molecules for LDL cholesterol. LDL cholesterol doesn't actually come in one type. It actually comes in very small, dense, um, molecules are very large fluffy molecules. Now the large LDL cholesterol molecules don't actually cause cardiovascular disease, only the small ones do. So the small ones will actually oxidize and after oxidizing they stick to the artery walls much easier and they'll cause arteriosclerosis. But the large ones, they never actually have this reaction. So what's very interesting is that somebody who has high LDL cholesterol may have these very small molecules, these small LDL molecules, and, and they're at risk of cardiovascular disease, or they may have the large molecules and they have no risk of cardiovascular disease. Likewise, you could get someone with a low level of LDL, and yet they would still have a lot of the small molecules and they're actually still at risk of cardiovascular disease. Another risk factor they found is homocysteine and this seems to be a very strong risk factor for cardiovascular disease. It's something that should really be broken down properly in the body but when the body is in a state of ill health it will produce way too much of homocysteine and this helps to oxidize LDL cholesterol. O as I said already, oxidized LDL cholesterol will stick to the artery walls much easier. So in 2009, a systematic review supported by the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada of, of prospective cohort studies or randomized trials concluded that there was insufficient evidence of association between intake of saturated fatty acids and coronary heart disease and pointed to strong evidence for protective factors such as vegetables and a Mediterranean diet 
and harmful factors such as trans fats and foods with a high glycemic index. So that's very interesting. And what's more, a massive study that came out in 2010 looked at 21 prospective studies that included a total of 347,747 subjects. Their result, there is absolutely no association between saturated fat and heart disease, American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. So when we look at these large studies, these meta-analysis that are looking at many different studies, we actually find there's no correlation between high fat intake and cardiovascular disease. Going back a few slides, if you remember the point I made about half of people, half of people who suffer heart attacks have low or normal levels of cholesterol. Well, that could be explained by the fact that a person may have a very low level of LDL cholesterol. And even if they do have a, a high level of LDL cholesterol, it mightn't be the type of LDL cholesterol which actually causes any problems. So, what actually happens in the arteries? Well, here we've got an artery and you can imagine the blood is flowing along here. On the inside layer we have the endothelium cells and behind that we have the smooth muscle walls. Now the smooth muscle walls can contract or dilate, increase and decrease blood pressure. Now, if you have a very high glycemic index, if you have a lot of blood sugar and a lot of insulin running around, High glucose is very corrosive and very damaging to the inner lining, the endothelium cells here, and it can cause a lot of damage. Likewise, if you have a lot of homocysteine or toxins built up, environmental toxins, uh, heavy metals, and various things like this can all cause damage to the inside your arteries. So when the artery becomes damaged, inflammation occurs, which is the natural response for repair. However, your blood is not going to be in a good state either because it's also carrying all these poisons and the LDL cholesterol in your blood is going to oxidize and become very sticky. So it sticks to these inflamed walls and arteriosclerosis starts to build up, the, uh, the arteries start to get narrower and narrower and you're on your way to a heart attack. So what we can find is that it's not really the cholesterol that's causing cardiovascular disease. Yeah, sure, cholesterol uh, maybe is definitely related to cardiovascular disease. High levels of cholesterol are a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, but it's not actually the root cause. The root cause of cardiovascular disease is inflammation of the arteries. Your arteries have become inflamed. And it's this damage that's been done to the arteries that's causing the plaque to build up. Now this is caused by trans fatty acids. Trans fatty acids are when you take an oil and you overheat it or you hydronate an oil. So you know hydronated oils are often in different spreads in baked goods and processed foods. Uh, these are all very dangerous. Also when you deep fat fry food you cook oil for a very long time you warp the fat molecules and the fat molecules become very toxic and dangerous in your system. So these are called trans fatty acids and these cause a lot of inflammation in the arteries. Also, pre-diabetes, insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. Now I covered all this in the last uh, cardio health tip number one. But very basically, if you're taking a lot of refined foods, a lot of processed foods, your blood sugar is being raised very quickly, you're taking a lot of sugar in your diet, a lot of fructose, corn syrup, sweeteners, these sort of things. These cause a lot of glucose triglycerides to form inside your arteries or to pass through your arteries and these are very corrosive to the inside your arteries and cause a lot of damage and a lot of inflammation. Toxins and metabolites such as homocysteine now, as I mentioned already, homocysteine is should be broken down properly and turned actually into an antioxidant called glutathione. But if you're in a bad state of health, you're going to have way too much homocysteine. That's also going to irritate your gut line, or sorry, your artery lining. Chemicals, uh, drugs, pesticides, heavy metals, pathogens, all these things can again affect your arteries and cause inflammation. So inflammation is really brought on by a high in sugar and refined flour, low fiber, processed diet. I'll say that again, a high in sugar, unrefined flour, 
low fiber processed diet. A sedentary lifestyle, excessive stress, lack of sleep, which, which goes in with the stress, and environmental pollution. All of these things add up to create an uh, environment inside your body that is not very conducive to you uh, or to, to healthy functioning in any form. And one of the areas that people tend to get hit first is in their arteries with cardiovascular disease. Statin drugs, do they have any effect? Well, they're designed to lower LDL cholesterol by blocking synthesis in the liver. Modern statins also have an anti-inflammatory effect, so they can calm inflammation in the arteries. But they, however, they have no preventative effect. If somebody has never suffered with cardiovascular disease, statins will do absolutely nothing for them. It will not reduce the likelihood of them actually getting a heart attack or developing cardiovascular disease. They can be beneficial for people with cardiovascular disease. If somebody is very inflamed, somebody is at very high risk of cardiovascular disease, a statin can be beneficial for them and can reduce their risk. It is a $29 billion market worldwide. And it's such a big industry that so much relentless, absolutely relentless research gets plugged into it and plowed into it. And there are resources that could really go in other directions and be looking at other ways of solving cardiovascular disease. So it's a bit like the medical community has tunnel vision because this is such a big area and this is such a money-making area that the focus has been lost in other areas. Now, there are problems with statins. Statins can lead to diabetes and cancer, and that's well documented. Statins lead to a loss of coenzyme Q10 in the body. Coenzyme Q10 is very important for muscle function and especially function of the heart. And without it, the heart literally will not have enough energy to beat. So one of the effects of statins is to actually create heart attacks because by lowering coenzyme Q10, you put a person at a much higher risk of heart attacks. So one of the side effects of statins is that you may actually get a heart attack from taking a statin. It causes muscle and liver damage. Now, sometimes this is irreversible and sometimes this is fatal. It can cause loss of memory and amnesia. If your cholesterol gets too low, you won't be able to form memories properly and in fact, uh, certain individuals have had total amnesia where they've lost their whole identity and their, uh, their whole sense of who they actually are. It can increase all-cause mortality. So while it might lower your cholesterol and it might even uh, stop you getting a heart attack, it might cause liver toxicity and kill you that way. So, you know, statins have to be used with extreme caution. Cholesterol is not the actual cause of heart disease. So as I was saying, it's inflammation that's actually the cause of heart disease. So statins do not address the underlying cause of heart disease. So how do you actually protect yourself from cardiovascular disease naturally? Well, for a start, have a diet high in plant steroids and soluble fibers. These include things like soya, tofu, oats, vegetables, seeds, nuts, beans, and lentils. All of these are high in fiber. Fiber binds to cholesterol and it pulls it out of the body. So that way you can actually reduce your cholesterol quite naturally and have lower levels of LDL cholesterol, which will reduce your risk some, somewhat. But also there tend, these foods tend to be high in antioxidants and other beneficial factors that can help you with your, with your cardiovascular disease. They're also, all these foods are very good at balancing blood sugar. So they will not lead to a, a spike in, uh, in glucose and blood sugar. And so that they really help you to reduce your inflammation of your arteries that way. Balance blood sugar to reduce LDL, triglycerides and reduce inflammation. And it will also increase the cholesterol particle size so that the LDL you do have is the large fluffy type and won't actually stick to your arteries. Get plenty of antioxidants. Fresh fruit, especially berries, blueberries are particularly good. If you can find them, get the acai berry and the goji berry, they're the, they're the top ones. And eat plenty of fruits and eat plenty of vegetables. Eat the rainbow, eat a mix of different colors of different foods because all the different colors contain different antioxidants and they all have different, slightly different beneficial effects on your, on your body. Eat oily fish three times a week. It's high in omega-3 for anti-inflammatory effects. Plus it lowers your blood pressure. 
eat plenty of green leafy vegetables, high in magnesium, they strengthen your heart and they relax your arteries, also very good for your liver, which you, which you use to excrete the cholesterol. Ginger, turmeric and garlic reduce cholesterol, but they also lower blood pressure and they have an anti-inflammatory effect. In fact, some people will even eat a clove of garlic every day because it will have such a powerful effect. It will thin your blood as well. So if you're on blood thinning medication, you need to just check with your doctor because you probably won't need the blood thinning medication anymore if you're taking sufficient amounts of these things. You can buy them in capsule form, but you can also just throw them into your food, put them into everything you're eating, have them with your dinner every day. They'll have a great effect on your system. Exercise at least three times a week. Now, I don't need to say any more about it. Everybody knows exercise is very good for them. Exercise improves your heart function, improves your metabolism, um, it lowers your insulin levels, it lowers your insulin resistance. It's just all round absolutely brilliant. If you could put exercise in a pill, you could make a fortune. Get your homocysteine measured. And if your homocysteine is high, take high B vitamins and zinc. Now, that will help reduce your homocysteine levels, but it's not the be all end all. You really need to take all these dietary uh, pieces of advice and use them all. You need to, to embrace the full picture here. You need to change your diet. You need to change your exercise habits. This is what will have the long lasting effects on your risk of cardiovascular disease. Spend more time connecting with loved ones. As I said already, from the Framingham study, we can see that stress, divorce, loneliness, these all actually create cardiovascular disease, or at least they're risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So spend more time with loved ones. Um, there's a whole area called psychoneuroimmunology. Um, it studies the effects of stress on the, on, the, on the body and how it affects the immune system, how it affects all different disease processes. And they found connecting with other human beings to be vitally important. It's a basic need we all have. And if we're not actually doing enough of it, we actually put ourselves at risk of disease. Things to cut back on. Avoid sugar and alcohol. Sugar, I covered all that in cardio health tip number one. So just watch that if you want tips on how to reduce that and how it actually affects your body. Alcohol, if you drink one or two drinks, that's no problem. But if you drink excessively or you drink a lot, then you must stop. It's damaging your arteries and it's causing toxicity in your body. Reduce stress, relax and think positive again, going back to the um, psychoneuroimmunology. Low stress relates to a much healthier system. The calmer you are, the better you are. If you're thinking angry thoughts you're, about things, it adds to inflammation in your body. It directly affects inflammation in your body, including inflammation of the arteries. Cut back on tea and coffee to reduce stress and help with blood sugar. Avoid deep fried foods and processed foods which are high in trans fats. If you have a deep fat fryer, throw it out. Stop buying quick meals, ready meals, um, and sweets from the supermarket. Instead, have home cooked food. Make food yourself, use recipes. Um, the more you rely on what you cook for yourself, generally the healthier you will get. Follow the tips that I've given you here and follow the tips from the other cardio health tips and you'll have no problems designing a diet there that will be excellent for, for your cardiovascular system. Avoid environmental toxins such as pesticides, food additives, smoking, aluminium cookware, drugs, fumes. So buy organic. Always go for organic. It's got much less uh, pesticides on it. Definitely never go for GM. They have been sprayed to the hilt with uh, toxins and pesticides. The reason they genetically modify foods is in fact to be able to spray them with more uh, pesticides and the pesticides they use are the most corrosive and damaging of all the, the poisons that they do put onto the, onto the crops. So avoid them like the plague. Um, food additives, they aren't doing your health no good, they're causing inflammation. Smoking as we know is highly correlated with cardiovascular disease. Aluminium cookware, yes if you're heating aluminium and using it in food, you know, you will absorb a certain amount of that aluminium and you, you know, it's not just obviously for cardiovascular disease, it's highly linked with Alzheimer's disease um, and any other sort of chronic inflammatory disease as well. Drugs, just cut down on them. If you don't need drugs, the idea is really to regain your health and not relying on drugs, you know. Drugs are a quick solution. If, you're, if your life is in danger, if you're at risk of dying, yes, you might need drugs. But 
on the long term they are not the solution the solution is to look at diet lifestyle exercise uh, all these environments connection with loved ones it's it's all these different factors you've got to see be holistic about this and see the complete picture that's the road to wellness and obviously fumes as well you know try to spend less time commuting on busy roads inhaling um toxins from the from car exhausts and try to get more time out in the fresh air so that's it for now thanks very much um i hope you got a lot of value out of this training if you implement the tips that I've given towards the end you will add years to your life and life to years I want to say thanks very much for watching and I hope to see you again soon bye for now